Hello and welcome to Baiju Exam Prep IAS. As part of a comprehensive news analysis, today we'll be discussing five important articles of the Hindu newspaper, Daily Edition. Before we begin, as always, we are available on Telegram, so do download the app via the QR code given here or the link given in the description below. We also have an important episode of International Relations this week, and I encourage you to subscribe to us on YouTube so that you don't miss any of our videos. Let's begin our analysis with a very interesting article, which is Renewable Energy Revolution Rooted in Agriculture. In the past one month, we have witnessed a lot of different editorial articles dealing with stubble burning in Haryana and Punjab with regards to the pollution in Delhi itself. And this is a very interesting article because the authors are from Niti Aayog and the FAO of the UN. And before we go into the nitty-gritty of the article itself, it is very relevant for your GS Paper 3. The point the authors are trying to make is that they're giving another important solution to stubble burning in Punjab and Haryana. We have seen pelletization, torrefaction. We've also seen a very important article last week, which talked about how we need to change the food profile, the crop profile of Punjab and Haryana itself. But what this article is suggesting is the concept of compressed biogas. The concept that compressed biogas can be used for commercial and industrial purposes and can be produced through the stubble, which is available in large quantities in Haryana and Punjab. So their solution is to produce compressed biogas and there is an important scheme which they refer to which is important for the examination generally. So the beginning of a renewable energy revolution can be rooted now in agriculture because finally the first bioenergy plant of a private company has been developed in Sangrur district of Punjab on 18th October. So there were a lot of initiatives which the Indian government was taking. However, everybody has realized the potentiality of this new type of concept. Therefore, now we have a private company which is investing into a biogas plant. Therefore, compressed biogas, which comes out of the paddy straw, can now convert agricultural waste into wealth. And also in the context of the current energy crisis, this can become an alternative fuel. So the first point is, for the first time, we have a private company which has established a compressed biogas plant. Now, before we go into what they are trying to argue, we need to understand how compressed biogas is actually produced. And when we talk about that, you take any form of feedstock, livestock waste, which is biodegradable. You put it into an anaerobic digester, which is decomposition in the absence of oxygen itself, anaerobic. Thereafter, what we get is digest and you have manure and slurry, but the most important biogas because this anaerobic decomposition produces a gas which can then be purified and compressed and then plant transported in cascades for domestic purposes, industrial purposes for vehicular and even commercial usages. So the basic concept is it's static science and technology. Anaerobic digestion can lead to biogas and compressed biogas is technically nothing but a transportable form of the biogas which is produced in the household sector itself. This is a very ingenious solution and a very important moment because if private sector is going to start to invest into this, there's a chance that anaerobic digesters and biogas can become a mainstream fuel in that regard. So the first point was private sector has now understood the importance. Second is the static portion that if any form of biodegradable waste is put into an anaerobic digester, you produce biogas. Along with that, you also get manure, which can be used in farms. And all the byproducts in a way have a basic usage within the domestic or the industrial sector. So what is the basic point of the article? The article is trying to argue that we already know that there's a very common practice in Haryana, Punjab and Western UP of stubble burning. And there are different solutions which were being looked upon to. So the Niti Aayog therefore approached the Food and Agriculture Organization India in 2019 to see if they could do something with the rice straw and therefore an ex situ solution could be found rather than the in situ solutions which we are being pushing at this point of time. Now the FAO thereafter studied the basic model of developing a crop residual supply chain in Punjab that could allow collection, storage, final use of rice straw for renewable energy itself. And the product of this whole effort was that the FAO and the Niti Aayog came to the conclusion that the techno-economic assessment was that rice straws can be used for two basic purposes and they're cost effective and they are actually possible within the rural sector which is 
compressed biogas and pellets pellets we've discussed already pelletization can be used in thermal power plants but the new solution is use it for compressed biogas and they gave a basic data to us though it's not of any purpose to us what is more important is the scheme they're referring to which is out of the 30 percent rice straw which is produced in Punjab the current target is to produce 5 percent of compressed biogas and the scheme under which this is happening is is extremely important for your examination sustainable alternative towards affordable transportation SATAT and this SATAT the stubble burning of paddy along with the larger biomass which is produced in Punjab could be used to produce compressed biogas at a rate of rupees 46 per kg which can then be used for vehicular industrial and home usages now this is extremely important why because if this fuel was very very expensive then it was a more or less futile process however the fuel isn't inexpensive it is lower than the compressed natural gas which we are using as of right now therefore paddy straw from one acre of crop can yield energy output worth more than 17,000 rupees an addition of more than 30 percent to the main output of grain this initiative is the ideal example of wealth for waste approach and circular economy which is that the waste is produced into energy and that energy in turn is also producing waste the concept of circular economy within the rural sector now with this you need to also understand the other benefits which is that it allows for the slurry and fermented organic manure from the plant to be used in replenishing soil fertility because of the organic matter which is available in the slurry itself chemical fertilizers can be replaced and this slurry can be used as an alternative to fertilizers also it provides employment to the rural youth because large value chain needs to be created in which paddy harvest collection bailing transportation and handling needs to happen therefore there needs to be a supply chain which needs to be created which in turn leads to employment opportunities at the end of the day this can boost the economy of punjab be it punjab be it haryana be it any state and it will at the end of the day create a lot of economic development because any economy will be boosted by a supply chain of raw material moving towards plants and which is in turn producing energy so it's an interesting topic small topic but interesting because at the end of the day we need to know these basic schemes the usages because the questions can come about benefits they can talk about the concept of biogas itself so i hope that you understand this topic very clearly now let's look at the second article which deals with the lancet report on health and fossil fuels the lancet a very important medical journal has pointed out that there's an economic cost for climate change itself it's talking about fossil fuel burning extreme events related to heat and heat exposure in turn having an economic cost because people are not able to work in their full capacity in that regard so therefore the lancet report is arguing that climate change has an economic cost and though the data itself has no purpose to us the issues which have been pointed out in the article are very important so what does the report point out the report as it is titled the lancet countdown on health and climate change health at the mercy of fossil fuels has pointed out that close to three lakh 30,000 people died in India due to exposure to particulate matter from fossil fuel combustion in 2020 and this is a very important aspect that PM 2.5 and PM 10 are doing major damage and 3 lakh people died because of just lung related or particulate matter related diseases. The report adds on from 2000 to 2004 and 2017 to 2021 heat related deaths increased by 55%. So between this span of four years and four years what we are seeing is that heat exposure is leading to more and more deaths in that regard 45 percent of urban centers in india are classified as moderately green or above so what it means is that only 50 percent close to 50 percent of the cities are called green in the sense that they have some greenery if not they are what we call as urban heat pads and in that sense they are creating more and more heat exposure to the people because of the cement and the concrete in that sense giving an indication of the economic loss which all this heat exposure produces the report states that in 2021 Indians lost close to 16,720 crore potential labor hours due to heat exposure which is equivalent to about 5.4 percent of the national GDP so when we talk about the economic cost we are losing 5 percent of the GDP because of the fact that people are not able to work outside 
therefore heat exposure is also leading to death and over and above that it is also the reason for people not working to their capacity so what lancet is trying to point out is that there is an economic cost of the climate change which we don't take into account further the report even argues that between 2012 and 2021 infants aged under 1 experienced higher number of heat wave days so basically who has been born in this period had seen more heat waves than any other generation in that regard additionally the duration of the growth season of maize has decreased by 2% compared to 1981 2020 and while rice and winter wheat have decreased by 1% now this is the most concerning out of all of them which is that the duration of the growth season the season is shrinking maize has decreased by 2% rice and winter wheat has decreased by 1% now this 2% 1% may not seem as something major but if it happens year on year within a decade or so we can have 10 to 20% loss in the duration of the season this means that our food growing capacity will go down this will have a major implication on food security in the world itself warning that governments are not focusing on the issues that are required and it said that in 2019 itself india had a net negative carbon price which means that we were subsidizing fossil fuels more than green energy therefore we were having a negative carbon price which is that fossil fuel price were lower than renewable energy price therefore there was a negative impact on the price itself to add to this point the report is also pointing out that india allocated close to 34 billion dollars close to 280000 crores in 2019 alone for the subsidy on the fossil fuel prices and therefore 37.5% of the country's national health spending that year was gone into subsidizing fossil fuels therefore biomass accounted for 61% of household energy in 2019 while fossil fuel around 20% and this is only indicative of high reliance on these fuels average household concentration of particulate matter exceeded who recommendations by 27 fold nationally 35 fold in rural homes so what is the point of this whole exercise first and foremost is that lancet is pointing out that there's an economic cost for climate change second the fact is that in india rural countryside is still very reliant on biomass as form of fuel india is putting close to 40% of its health budget into subsidizing fossil fuel therefore negative carbon price itself and more than that what is more concerning is which is food security problem which is that all durations of our three major crops maize wheat and rice are shrinking 1% every year however that is a major problem in that regard because this in turn could lead to a major food crisis in the future so this article tries to point out and it's an alarm bell for all of us that there is an economic cost for climate change and more than that fossil fuel burning needs to stop as soon as possible now let's go into the third topic which is an interesting one related to art and culture which is related to stolen antiquities and when we talk about stolen antiquities it is interesting because we get a chance to understand the 1970 convention of the unesco the context of the article is that tamil nadu idol wing of the cid has actually traced two chola era bronze idols which were stolen 50 years ago from the Vishwanatha Swami Temple at Alathur in the Tiruvallur district of Tamil Nadu and had been smuggled to the United States now the Tamil Nadu government has sent documents to the possessors of these antiquities that they are the rightful owners of the antiquity now the chola era bronze sculptures are one of the finest made out of the lost wax technique itself they are the one of the most sought after and one of the best specimens of bronze sculpture in india when it comes to nataraja or any of these they are very very expensive and very very important for our heritage in that regard the tamil nadu cid wing has located three idols which belong to a very important temple in tamil nadu but was smuggled and what is more interesting here is that the idols of vishnu shri devi and bhuva devi belonging to the vishwanatha swami temple was stolen and what happened was that on further investigation we found out that they were stolen and replicas had been left in place of them so the idol wing has traced one of the idols in the ferrer gallery of 
the Smithsonian Institute in Washington DC and the other one in the christies.com of the US the dancing sambandar idol was sold off by the christies in 2011 for 98500 dollars equivalent to close to 81 lakh rupees and this is why they are so important because they are quite expensive in that regard and this is not the only one because the idol wing also traced one of the idols of yoga narasimha and ganesh of the same temple in the nelson atkins museum of art in kansas city in the us itself now when we talk about this article it's important because first you need to remember vishwanatha swami temple because it is in the news now further the bronze sculpture of the chola has become very important because now they can be asked as a question because they were in the news but what is more important is how do we get back these antiquities and therein comes the unesco resolution and a very important convention which we call as the 1970 resolution or 1970 convention so before i move on to the convention itself which is the static portion why are we doing this because you need to know the temple you need to understand that a lot of indian antiquity is being smuggled abroad they are very expensive we don't understand and value our own culture and we need to understand the worth of it when the west can do it we can also do it in that regard but the main purpose of doing this is to understand the unesco 1970 convention what is the 1970 convention and let's try to decode the basic mandate within it the 1970 convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import export and transfer of ownership of culture property urges state parties to take measures to prohibit and prevent illicit trafficking of culture property it provides a common framework for the state parties on the measures to be taken to prohibit and prevent export import and transfer of cultural property this is the main treaty or main convention which is used to get back and claim that our culture was taken away from us in an illegal way therefore what the tamil nadu cid will now do is that they will claim under the convention that because tamil nadu state government is the rightful owner of these antiquities it needs to be given back by the us the return and restitution of culture property is central to the convention and its duty is not only to remember but to fundamentally safeguard the identity of peoples and promote peaceful society whereby the spirit of solidarity will be strengthened so it also protects the whistle blowers tell that this idol has reached certain places therefore it's not just about protection and prevention it's also about restitution it's also about recovery and return thus the 1970 convention is fully in line with the sustainable development goal of the united nations 2030 agenda that cultural identity and cultures need to be protected so for the purpose of the examination 1970 convention becomes important for you because this can come directly as a question in the examination what is the 1970 convention and what does it deal with so please understand one thing the article itself talks about two basic idols being identified having three figures in the us taken from temples from india a practice which was quite common during the british period and now also there are certain smugglers who do this chola era bronze sculpture is extremely important lost wax technique used is also very very important therefore remember lost wax technique chola era the name of the temple and further the convention itself so what have we done till this point we've tried to understand three basic articles first we understood how stubble burning can be used to generate wealth out of waste which is that basically stubble burning is a wasteful process now what the niti ayog and fao are ad- arguing is that stubble can be used through a supply chain for the production of biomass and biogas itself and that biomass could be used in fertilizers and biogas can be used in different aspects related to commercial and home purposes thereafter we understood the lancet report which pointed out that there is an economic cost for the climate change heat exposure is becoming a problem over and above that seasons and durations are reducing and india is still quite reliant on the concept of biomass for energy and the pm levels are at an alarming level of 27 fold and 35 fold higher than what the who actually prescribes this was more about the concept of art and culture the 
conservation and protection of certain antiquities the fact that indian antiquities are very very popular abroad and therefore we need to protect them and the 1970s convention in a way tries to make sure that conservation happens but also restitution and recovery is also possible now let's move to the next article which is a very interesting one because a newspaper is talking about a television and this is related to social issues and fake news so basically what the article is trying to point out three very basic conclusions first is that less number of people are reading newspapers people are getting their news out of social media and third even though people know that basically they can't trust television for news still it is the most dominant source of news in india so it's a paradox basically people know they can't trust it but they still watch it so indian news consumers trust in private tv news channels is relatively much lower than their belief in newspapers yet television continues to be the dominant news source so they know that the newspaper is more reliant however they will still go to the television to get their news notably their trust in online news websites is lower than even the private channels while the former is the third preferred source for accessing news after news channels in the smartphone era itself despite the fact that newspapers are becoming more and more irrelevant in the digital age people are going to online websites for news but they don't trust it they trust it the least when it comes to newspapers and television but television which cannot be trusted is the biggest source and we'll go through these tables to understand this very simply what is being pointed out is that first people don't trust television when it comes to the news which is being given but they go to it as a dominant source people don't trust online news websites though it is the third most important source in the smartphone era and the most reliant is newspaper but the least amount of people actually read newspapers and this is the basic point of this article so let's try to decode this concept see what does table 1 show proportion of indians accessing news through various means 71% watch news channels 48% read newspaper 37% visit news sites so when it comes to accessing news through various sources 70% of consumers said that they watch news channels 48% newspaper 37% which is online website now this is a very concerning aspect if you look at the next table which is through which medium do you mostly get or obtain your news television 42 6% news 1% radio so newspaper 6% 1% radio 22% internet 18% people now dominant news sources amongst the participants 40% said tv 22% said new media 6 and 1% said that they actually went to newspaper and radio and this is the concerning aspect so the first and the second table show a very very dangerous trend which is that 70% look at the news channels 48% read the newspaper 37% visit the website to consume news however mostly they get their news from the television 22% of them get from the internet only 6% actually look up towards the newspaper among the participants to get their news in that regard now table 3 is even more interesting which is the presence of media and communication sources in indian homes and here 75% of them have television set 27 only have newspaper access so 3 out of every 4 households have a television set close to 1 in 4 get a newspaper daily and 13% actually get magazine periodically or often there is a music system or a transistor in 22% homes whereas 76% have at least one smartphone owning member what this means is that television still dominates as a source and this is what we were trying to point out in the first table which is that people don't have actual access to newspapers so they actually rely on the news on the television sets in that regard what is more interesting is that online website are the least trusted amongst the news sources only 11% strongly trust them 
fewer than 13% who said the same for private TV channels. In contrast, twice the share, 31% said that they strongly trust newspapers, 60% strongly or somewhat trust newspapers. Now, this is a very important point. Though people have 75% access to news from te televisions, they don't trust it. And what they trust, they don't get, which is that what 31% trust the newspaper, but they don't technically have access to it. This is the bigger issue which we are trying to point out through this article, which is that the source which is available to everybody is the most unreliable. On the other hand, the most reliable source is technically not accessed by everybody else. And this is why this article becomes important because this allows for fake news and people to be manipulated by different sources in that regard. With this, let's enter the last article which deals with exports with China. And there's an encouraging story coming out which is that our export to China and its growth is now exceeding the import growth from China, which is India's trade equation with China has been improving in the recent years with outbound shipments rising faster than imports whose growth is being driven largely by vital raw material and to meet high demand for high growth sectors such as telecom and power. So what they're technically trying to point out is that our exports to China are growing faster than imports from China. And just to quantify this data, China is one of the most important trading partners. The trade flows between the two countries has grown from about 72 billion in 2014-15 to 115 billion in 2022 itself. But what is the encouraging story here is that from 11.9 billion in 2015, India's export to China has risen by 78.1% to 21.25 billion last year, while imports, which is imports from China, stood at $94.16 billion, 55% over what it was in 2015, which is $60 billion. So our exports are growing at a 80% mark and our imports are growing at a 50% mark. And this is the encouraging aspect in the story that we are exporting to China and at a much faster rate in that regard. And what we're actually importing is intermediary goods, which is a third of India's imports from China, while capital goods is another 19.3% for the telecom and power sector, the most important two sectors for India's growth itself. And just to give you a basic idea of what we are importing from China, electronic components, computer hardware, peripherals, telecom instruments, organic chemicals, industrial machinery for dairy, residual chemicals, allied products, electronic instruments, bulk drugs and intermediates. So mostly it is major machinery which we are getting from China itself. But what the article is also pointing out is that PLI scheme, which is production linked incentive scheme is also important. And in a way it is helping in making sure that this number surpasses this number in that regard. Before we go to the main question, what have we done today? Five very interesting articles, most of them with GS paper three. First, we understood the concept of compressed biogas, how it can be a game changer in the industrial and the household sector itself and how stubble burning, which is a major issue can be stopped via this concept. Thereafter, we talked about through Lancet's report, the cost of climate change, the economic cost of people not working, the fact that heat exposure due to climate change in turn is leading to people not working. And more than that, the duration of maize, wheat and rice is reducing the season itself is reducing now we need to see this as a very major alarm for our food security further biomass still remains a major form of fuel in the rural sector and particulate matter in these sectors is very very high then we move to the tamil nadu cid's very important revelation that Chola era bronze sculptures had been smuggled to the US. We have located them. And the most important discussion we had there, 1970 convention of the UNESCO. And in the last two articles, first we understood a very major oxymoron or a paradox. People watch what they don't trust. People watch more television, but they, they actually don't trust the medium itself. Newspaper, the people more trust. However, they don't have access to it or they don't want to access it itself. And the last article deals with an encouraging trend which is coming out, which is that Indian exports to China is growing faster 
than Indian imports from China. With this, let's try to understand the main questions. What is compressed biogas? How can it be used to mitigate the energy crisis and pollution issues in India? So this technically talks about how compressed biogas is a solution and what is it? Second, what is the UNESCO 1970 convention? Discuss its role in conservation of our heritage. Both are very interesting questions. We encourage you to write them. Thank you so much for your patience. I will see you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.